Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Wow, what an introduction. I've earned my gray hair. Uh, just want to give a shout out to two people I met beforehand because I live my life both in urban planning, planning and parks. So Lisa and Dina, it was a pleasure to meet you. Uh, I do have a bit of a story. I've been a planner my entire life. And I remember when I was appointed as parks commissioner, all my planning friends said, you sell out, how could you leave planning and go to parks? And that really hurt my feelings uh, because I saw myself as a planner. But it wasn't until the 2017 conference in New York, we had a planning conference, where I finally realized the difference between planning and parks. And what I told the audience is that people literally hug you when you open up a park. I mean, it's true. Am I right, Dina? In my entire life, no one has ever hugged me for creating a rezoning application or a master plan. So, Lisa, if you want a hug, get involved in parks. So I'm here to talk about the 10 critical elements that will make tomorrow's communities. Uh, throughout my career, I always believe it's important that we identify these emerging trends. It's the job, I believe, of staff is to identify these emerging trends like a stockbroker watches the market. We need to anticipate what is coming so we can be prepared. And so a lot of this presentation is going to talk about what are those critical elements. We could talk later on during the Q&A, what does it mean for city or suburban or rural, but these are the trends that I have identified that we have to pay attention to. First, I want to talk about the company I worked for. Uh, I've been in the public sector almost my entire life. I was trying to retire until a friend of mine who was CEO of McAdams said, please don't, just stay with us for a couple of years. So I agreed to help them uh, to stay on board, but it's a company based in North Carolina and Texas. We have offices in Raleigh and in Charlotte, and you can see some of the work that we do. So it's my privilege to serve as a special advisor on parks and planning in particular, and so that's something that I'm very passionate about, and at least for the next few years, I'll be able to help the firm. So let's talk about why we're here. The United States continues to grow. And if you look at the top markets in 2021, and it's not that different in 2022, that you see both Raleigh and Charlotte are one of the top five real estate markets in the United States. What does that mean? You're gonna grow. Your desirable location in a metropolitan region, and you will be a place and you are a place, both this town and this county, that people want to move to. Now, people always want to say, I don't want to grow. To me, because of this chart, saying you don't want to grow is saying I don't want it to rain. It's inevitable. Your desirable place, I took a tour around the town. It was delightful, both the county. This is a beautiful location in the city. Great quality of life, low taxes, low crime, great schools. This is a great place to live and raise a family but it's catching on. Most of that growth is not coming from this region, it's coming from outside. Now, people say I don't wanna grow, well, I don't know what happened, but since 2000, your growth exploded. This is Union County. And if you look at that line, it's going straight up. So for those that say I don't wanna grow, I don't know how you're gonna bend that curve. It's gonna be very difficult, but you are growing and growing rapidly. And you can see it started in 1960s, 1980s, and I'm sure there were people said, I don't want to grow, and the more they said they didn't want to grow, they grew faster. There's a spike, and that trend is going to continue. You don't see it bending. You're a desirable location. Word is out. That chart I share with you is showing it. Those are the places that people are now moving. Well, where are they coming from? Well, let's take a look at some of the migration trends, not immigration, migration trends of people living here in the U.S. Where are they going? and where are they coming from? Cost of living for people who moved was the top reason in 2021. They're looking for smaller places, second tier cities. They want a different lifestyle because the cost of living where they live is too high. And so they're looking at places like Union County, Mecklenburg, Charlotte region. They're coming from California, Illinois, Michigan, New York, and New Jersey. Those are the top five states. And when people move to a new location, they bring their values and their attitudes and their, what a place should be. So there's always going to be the tension of the newcomers and those that have been here, whether it's five years, 10 years, or 15 years. When they come, they have an orientation of what a place, a community is supposed to be. And there's always that, what I call creative tension about what is the next for that community. They're coming. 
the five states where they're going to, and those Californians, they're just all over the place, and now I heard that Texas is now their number one destination, so may have to update this chart. But in 2020, it was Idaho, Arizona, Tennessee, South Carolina, and North Carolina were the places people were going to. For all the good reasons. And 20% expressed a desire to move from a larger city to a small, smaller community. They want that better connection, that hometown feel, that small town feel, versus where they were in larger cities. And despite the pandemic, that trend continues. It's slowing down a bit because of interest rates, but right now, we're still seeing those same trends follow through. So I always like to provide this chart. I've been doing this chart now for about 15 years. I'm always updating it to talk about some of the emerging trends that we have to deal with. You could put your head in the sand, pretend it doesn't exist. These are the emerging issues and challenges that we have to face, whether in government, public service, and we can't deny it, it's still gonna happen. And so it is my role to share, when I was plan director with the city council, how are we gonna deal with some of these trends? The public health crisis, we're now finally bending the curve and coming out of it. The racial and social justice issues, divisive politics and the post-COVID behavior. Even though we're coming out of COVID, there's still a change in how people are gonna to adapt to going to work, to hybrid lifestyles, to moving to different places where they can work from home. These are affecting the places that we live and work and plan for. And so I wanna make sure that we look at this, I'll talk about some of the other issues at the top that are affecting how we plan for our communities. There's no question that COVID was a gut punch for this planet. There are some people that are still wearing masks, they're not comfortable, they don't think COVID is over. Uh, we're now seeing uh, the drought. A lot of people leaving California, I'm sure you've seen some of the pictures out west, they are running out of water with a historic drought, not just for people to live, but for businesses. And so that drought map was just from last summer, and it hasn't gotten any better. This is a serious issue, and a lot of people from California and other places like saying, I'm done, I'm out. I'll never forget when I was in Detroit, they said, what do we have going for us? I said, you have water, you have lakes. Uh, but in other places, it is a challenge. So you're now looking at Falls Lake. This is Raleigh's Reservoir in 2008. We had 30 days, I'm sorry, 60 days of water left. There was panic throughout the region. That was the first time I understood how industry needed water just as much as our home, our homeowners did. And we had to really change the way we were gonna plan going forward. In fact, we just started our comprehensive plan and realized we were running out of land and we were certainly running out of water. And so this was an opportunity to change the way we plan for the future of how we dealt with you reuse water for car washes and start to charge people more for their, what they watered their lawn versus their house. There was a lot of change. Luckily it rained and that problem was solved. So there are some places that have too little water and there are some places that have too much water. As we see weather patterns changing, there's not a week that goes by that you don't find a place that had a heavy rain, and now they're flooded. And we have to understand going forward, how do we plan our community to address some of these hazards and these weather events that are affecting communities across the country. Another issue why Californians are leaving, and this is not just California, it's happening in Canada, it's happening in Australia, because of these extreme weather, you're seeing more and more fires, and people are deciding to move to other parts of the country because they had enough. Now, I'm not here to depress you, I'm just kind of setting the stage for what's coming next, but these disruptions are really affecting a lot of anxiety and is asking people, do I still wanna live here or do I wanna move somewhere else? And then there's extreme heat. This was from last summer, it's worse this year. And we see this pattern getting worse and worse, and so all of these disruptions are affecting where people want to live to have a different lifestyle. And like I said, you're still on the top list, number five. And so many reasons people are saying, I wanna to move to North Carolina, I wanna to move to this region. So the United States over the next 50 years is expected to grow, mostly by natural birth, some by immigration, 120 million people. We will have to figure out in this country where are we gonna fit 50 million 
new housing units to accommodate that growth. That's reality for the entire US. As the population grows, they need more housing. And the big question is, what will the next generation of communities look like? The 1950s, the 1960s, or something different? Because you will see, as I get in this presentation, different generations have different expectations for a lifestyle choice, for homes, for communities. And it's changing. It has always been changing. And so we'll see what's going to happen. So that's the big question. What will the next generation of communities look like in the United States, in North Carolina, in Union County, in the town of Waxhaw? That's the big question. It's going to change. So that takes me to the 10 critical elements that I believe that will make tomorrow's communities. We'll quickly go through each one. And then at the end, I'll stop to see if you have any questions. Uh, but based upon my research, these are the top 10. The last one about smart homes, that's more of just a guess, a prediction. But we do see that trend continuing. So let's start first with the graying and the browning of America. I think you all know there's something called a silver tsunami. They didn't name it after me. And what you're now seeing is that the aging of the population, not just here, but across the planet. Now, here's a fact, whether you care or not, in Japan, they're now selling more adult diapers than they are children's diapers. That country is aging and is happening across the planet. The only reason why U.S. stays younger is because of our immigration policy. That's the only reason why. Otherwise, we'd save the same fate. The browning of America, I'm sure you've heard about that. I'll get into that a little bit further. Changing household type, I'll get into that as well. The rise of the single person household, and this one is a shocker because no one expected this to happen. Millennials were tied to urban places and COVID forced them to reset and they decided to buy a home. That freaked out all predictions, including myself, I'll confess. Years ago, I predicted that there would be an excess of single family homes because millennials would not leave cities or urban places to go to the suburbs. COVID changed that. And now we're seeing them return but that trend uh, really shocked a lot of people. So let's talk about the new reality in the US. There are more older Americans, and they're living longer. We have more diversity, more multiculturalism, more people with disabilities, and we're seeing more multi-generational households. We call it the sandwich generation. Uh, a child is now taking care of their parent, but they're also raising their children. And so you're now seeing three generations in a home Another trend that is happening is those that are deciding not to go back to the workforce because of COVID, they're now staying with their parents. Men, I hate to say it more so than women, but that's another trend that we're seeing. So you're seeing these more households. Uh, fewer, more single mothers, fewer couples are getting married, immigration will continue, and then by 2030, the majority household in the United States is one person. Not a family, one person. And that trend will continue. And then by 2045, there'll be no majority race. Now, I used to share this, this is for the last 10 years, some people get totally freaked out, but this is a snapshot of North Carolina to show the demographic change from 1980 to 2040. The darker the color shows the higher concentration of people of color, and you'll just see the time lapse. This has been predicted for decades, but now it's becoming a reality. A lot of people are getting a lot of anxiety about it. This has nothing to do with immigration. This is just the natural births and migration patterns of those that live in the United States. This is 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, where we are today in 2020, 2030, and then 2040. It is important that we understand that demographics are changing. A lot of this is driving our divisive politics I mentioned earlier. But as a community, we have to recognize we all love our country. We all want the best for our family. But there are some that are quite anxious about what this tells. But as we see communities changing, we have to understand how we diver uh, embrace diversity because it's becoming more and more a reality. Let's get to the graying of America. As I stated, by 2030, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. 
one in five Americans have a disability, that's going to increase. And these older Americans, they are so healthy. Their life expectancy is gonna increase from 76 years from 1993 to 82.6 years by 2050. So not only we have an aging population, they're gonna be here a lot longer. And so I can't even tell you what the healthcare system is gonna happen if we don't get enough labor force to take care of us as we age. But by 2050, the number of Americans over 85 will triple from 5 million to close to 20 million by 2050. And the biggest challenge is that the land use and transportation choices will have to change, which is why in Raleigh we shifted to having more walkable places for those that are aging, because on average, 600,000 Americans every year stop driving once they reach the age of 70. So I'm hoping either we design places differently or we escalate and expedite autonomous vehicles. We do not want to see our older Americans isolated because they cannot get into a car, which is a primary form of transportation in the US. So these are some of the challenges, or they break their budget on taking Uber everywhere. I talked about marriage rates. Uh, I'll never forget when I went to a college campus and I was given a slide presentation, this young man was talking to this young lady throughout my whole presentation. I said, stop. Young lady, he's not serious. How do I know? This chart tells me so. <laughs> Back in the 60s, 80 to 90% of people between 25 and 34 were getting married and starting families. Not today. It's hovering around 50%. Oh, well, we have to make sure we have homes for families because they're going to get, no, they're not getting married. Now, some are delaying it until they're older. They're putting it off. Or some just decide not to get married and live together. But the bottom line is we're seeing marriage rates drop, and it continues to drop until this very day. And I want you to see, now I have to give you a heads up because you're different here in this county. Everything I'm sharing with you, you're on the other end of the spectrum, which is a shocker. I was sharing with the mayor that, uh, or I think it was Jeff, uh, I was shocked by your demographics locally because you bucked this trend. There's something in the water in Union County. But in any event, nationally, you're seeing the shrinking of households with children from 48 to 20 population in just a few years from now. It's changing. Birth rates are dropping. People aren't getting married or are putting it off later on. And the question is, how do you then plan for communities when you see the landscape of the market changing? So this is a very interesting slide. I tell you about the rise of single-person households. It's driven by widowers and widows and those that get divorced. The majority of single-person households, 39% are the baby boomers. Gen X and millennials represent 19% each, and then the Gen Z is about 3%. So it's not just people who decide not to get married. You know, man, I hate to tell you this, your wives will outlive you, live us. And so they right now are single-person households representing a house all by themselves. That is the United States trend, and that's as recently as 2020. Now, I said Union County, you are unbelievable. I don't know how many babies you're having on a regular basis, but you're at three persons per household. The nation average is 2.5. North Carolina average is 2.5. I've been doing this for 15 years. I've never seen three. So this is a place that has a lot of families, a lot of kids, or some people are taking care of their parents, or the kid is just not leaving, uh, but that is a very, very unusual number. A lot of people here are married, well over the 60%, so there's something different about Union County. Uh, but in terms of housing choices, ownership by occupied units, you're at 83% owner-occupied. Most places are between 50 and 60%, which means you have a shortage of rental either homes for rent, rental apartments, multifamily, you're way above, so primarily there are not a lot of places that people who are looking to buy a home can live here until they find a home, which means that this is a challenge, and you'll see in a second how that plays itself out. So years ago, I used to do this whole profile on the different generations. Uh, I won't go too deep into it, except what saddens me is the greatest generation will be ceased to be with us. We just lost Queen Elizabeth today at 96. She was not part of the greatest generation. She was part of the silent, mature generation. They will no longer exist on the planet. They fought in World War II. My father was the greatest generation. 
what made them great, and I want you to hear me carefully, that generation gave their today for our tomorrow. Think about that. They gave their today for our tomorrow. Today, it's reversed. Today, this generation wants to give your tomorrow away for our today. We're in charge, this is how we're gonna plan. We're in charge, this is what we're gonna build. We're in charge, this is what we're gonna prove. We're giving away the next generation's tomorrow for our today, even though we have limited time on this planet. We have got to figure out how to release that and let the next generation define their future like the greatest generation. But here's all the generations, the newest one on the scene is Generation Alpha, they're quite young. Why do I share this with you? Each one of these generations have different values and aspirations for where we should live. Before I get into that, let's take a look at this chart. I call it the YZ Alpha Factor, residents in the county, and I put some other places there. I have Union County, Mecklenburg County, Charlotte, North Carolina, US. In the town of Waxhaw, 55% of the residents are under 40. In the county, 51% are under, the majority of people who live here are under 40. And they're gonna be here a long time if they decide to establish roots here. The question is, are we thinking about their choices, their lifestyles, their needs, aspirations, as we make decisions about their future? Most places I go to, the answer is no. But I'm hoping that you're thinking differently and you understand this chart. So as you see across the board, Mecklenburg, 57%, Charlotte, 59%. Uh, you're above the national average in North Carolina. So younger people are choosing to live here in their 30s and 40s. But there's a catch. Whoops. Gen Z is not coming back. When your children leave to go to college, for whatever reason, I don't know why, either there's no housing choices here they don't like, they, they can't afford, there's no options for them, they don't like the experiences that this place offers. But look at that drop across the board. Gen Z goes from, in Mecklenburg County, from 25%, no change. In Charlotte, 26% actually goes up. In North Carolina, it goes from 22% to 23. But in the county, it goes from 30% and it's cut in half. Town of Waxhaw, 34%, it goes down to 14%. Our kids are not returning. <laughs> And I don't know, I don't, did enough, I don't have enough insight to tell you why that is, but there's something about the county that once they leave and go to school, or they're old enough to leave, I'm out. I'm gone. And they're being replaced by newcomers. Now, I don't know why, but that's just something for food for thought. That something is happening here in the county and the town where once they get to that age, they're out. So as I said, each one of these generations have different values, needs, and aspirations. And it drives consumer preferences and market demands for homes and for communities, what it offers. And it keeps changing. It's not the same as the 60s and the 70s, it's changing. And as people migrate here, they bring those values about place with them, and so I'm sure conversations about what we should build and what things should look like are going to change. One of the trends is that people now prefer a townhouse and not a single family home. Same size, you don't have to do as much work, but there are some that feel no, it's a single family home is the American model and that's what we should build. But values and needs are changing. So from my perspective, the values, needs, lifestyle preferences will change. It will jive consumer preferences and market demand. It will change the state and local governance. And it's not just about what's next, it's about who's next. And I do believe there's gonna be a lot of tension over the next 10 years as we sort this all out because we're seeing the rise of the X, Y, Z generation that wants to assume leadership roles, run for office, because they wanna make sure their needs and values are reflected in the built environment and where they live. And so to me, it's not a fight of right or left. It's 20th century clashing with 21st century values, and that's what we're in the midst of right now. I mentioned this earlier, a lot of people have a funny reaction. I've been working in this space on diversity, equity, inclusion for about 30 years. Uh, it's not something new, but I like to define it so we understand what we're talking about since our demographics are changing. The word diversity means the value of different perspectives. That's it. 
has nothing to do with race or class. It's the value of different perspectives. Religion, gender, age, race, income, disability, ability. It's listening to different voices so you can come together and make the best decision as possible. That mysterious word equity, oh, equity means fairness. I have a hard time explaining to somebody what equity means, but it's very easy for me to tell them what fairness means. That side got investment, my side didn't. This road got improved, mine didn't. This that got this, I didn't. Fairness. The goal is to make sure we are fair about how we deliver services, how we plan our communities. It's fairness. So I don't even use the word equity anymore. I just say, is it fair? Versus is it equitable? Is it fair? And then finally, inclusion is removing all barriers so that all feel welcome in our zoning codes. We could say you're not welcome just by how you plan your zoning code and what you allow or disallow. And so you want to make sure that if you are a welcoming community, that you want to be inclusive of who can enjoy your parks, your cities, your businesses, you want to make sure you are inclusive. So let's get to the first one, the second one. Healthy living, fitness for life. Oh my goodness, the 55 plus, they're coming. They want to stay alive, they're active, they have money, and they're moving here. They're active, and they don't drive as much. So if you're worried about, oh my goodness, if we approve this, there'll be all this traffic. No, people who retire have very different travel patterns than those who are working. They're living a lot longer. They want places that offer walking, biking, access to greenways, and sidewalks on both sides of a subdivision are in high demand. I'm a runner, I'm a marathoner, and a biker, I'm on the greenway. I was sharing during uh, dinner that most of the people that I see, the majority, are people who are over 55. By the way, on the bikes, they're passing me. These are some healthy, healthy people. They're looking for communities that offer these amenities because they don't just want a home, they want to make sure they have other uses. And then, I think we all know, I don't know what happened with pickleball, but it's exploded. It is the biggest trend craze happening. Look how serious that guy is. I mean, he's just waiting for that ball to come back, but this is who they are, 55 plus, they're active, and they're coming to North Carolina, and they want to have a great lifestyle. This is, not a, this is now a, a very common seat in many of our parks. They're not going to work. They have money. They're staying active. They're enjoying themselves. This is who's coming. And some of them, by the way, are renting. They're not ready to buy. This is who are some of your future renters, by the way. Oh, the greenway. Look, look at the joy on that man's face. I mean, this is what happens when you offer this great greenway. They're just happy. They're joyful. They're out there getting healthy, so this is critical. They want to make sure there's access to uses. Quality design. People don't mind having a smaller home in exchange for better design, both interior and exterior. Here's an example of probably a maybe 1,800 square foot home, well designed, and this is what the market's now producing. People don't mind smaller places Sloan has better design. As I said, both inside, high quality amenities, and this happens to be a townhouse, what you just saw, the interior. This is now one of the fastest parts of the market, and if people say, well, it's too dense, those are going between five and 600,000 in the Raleigh market. So these are some very wealthy people buying this product, and we're seeing it more and more because people just don't want to take care. This is the HOA. You move in, someone else takes care of it. You have a great lifestyle. What's important is that you are a town, you're a county. You have to take advantage of the regional amenities. You can't provide it all, but you want to make sure within your region, people are when driving distance of some of the other great amenities that they could enjoy. There's a value in regionalism. You rise as a region, you fall as a region. You need to promote what's happening in the entire region and work together as municipalities. Again, either you rise or you fall. I remember when I was in the Triangle, I said, we have to root for Durham. I was like, you're in Raleigh, why are you rooting for Durham? Because if Durham goes down, the region goes down. So I'm gonna cheer if Durham gets a new job, a new uh, company, because they may live in Raleigh and in our parks, and the entire region benefits. So there's a value in regionalism. Support your parks and regional assets. Make sure in the region you have proximity to trails and greenways. If you don't have one yet, 
Find some place nearby that does and figure out how you can connect so that you now have this regional network of greenways and trails. And people don't just buy a home. They buy a place. They don't just live in their house. They want to make sure there's stuff to do, so they're very conscious about if I move in this house, what do I do? Where do I go? Because I can't have a concert in my backyard. I can't have, well, maybe some people can if they have enough land. But parks, these amenities are not just for physical health, but they're for mental health as well. And we learned that during COVID. So here are some examples. Uh, I'm headed, okay, this is a favorite park of mine in Australia. I'm heading there in a couple of weeks. Uh, but this is now what you see growing on our region. This is the Charlotte-Mecklenburg region. This is where we are. You see all these amenities are just growing and growing and growing. And this is my favorite. Do you all know what this is? It's Falls River Park in Greenville. One of my favorites. I don't know if you can see the people, how beautiful this is. You see the scale of the people? It just is a regional amenity close here. I'm guessing maybe about an hour, 90, about an hour drive. Two hours, okay. Sorry, you need light rail. I mean, uh, high speed. <laughs> and the reason why I say this is that as commissioner, I was there in New York City when a pandemic started. But one of the lessons that I've learned is that this was nothing compared to 1918, where half a billion people were infected and there were 50 million deaths. And I learned back then that there was an explosion in green space. Now, Frederick Law Olmsted is the person who designed Central Park. I don't know if you know this. His son died of cholera. And I suspect that that motivated him to start planning and designing parks throughout the United States. That pandemic spurred this explosion of green space, and we're seeing the same thing happen today. More and more people are going to parks for mental health reasons, to get outdoors. COVID improved it, and now we're seeing that effect post-COVID where we're seeing this explosion of green space. Why am I sharing this slide with you? I'll be very honest. In August of 2020, between the protests in New York City, because they all happened in our parks, running a staff that had to come to work, father of a family, a husband, and then all this stuff happening, I was the lowest point of my life I thought I was gonna break. I was having a mental breakdown. And here I am, I managed a 10 thousand person agency and I was overwhelmed. We reached out to the Department of Health and she graciously shared with us what was going on. Now, stress is good. You have a deadline, there's something you need to get done, you need that adrenaline to get it done. But prolonged stress, like being in lockdown and isolation, leads to anxiety. And long-term anxiety leads to trauma. And that's what we were going through during the lockdown. So let's take a look at some of the impacts. Physical, exhaustion, low energy, emotional, denial, fear, inability, anger, behavioral, emotional outbursts, smoking, using alcohol, which by the way almost doubled during COVID, memory problems, trouble making decisions, feeling emptiness or a loss of purpose. I was on this list. I felt many of those things. My staff felt many of those things. People coming to our parks, in our city, felt many of those things, and guess what? People in your family, and some of you, were going through the very same thing. So we had to figure out in our role, what do we do in the parks department? Little did I know, we took another course called the Trauma Stewardship Institute. I didn't even know they existed, but there they are. And they told us, in order to deal with some of these issues, go outside, be active, Spend time with animals. We actually invited little puppies and kittens to my office just to ease anxiety, and it worked. And so we repositioned our role. That's why parks are so critical, right, Dina? And so we realized parks serve more than just places for physical health. During COVID, they became our sanctuaries of sanity, and they offer the power to heal and bring joy. So I'm a big fan of parks. Yes, I was commissioner but I felt that power by itself. So let's talk about, I'd rather say traditional neighborhood development than new urbanism, I'm gonna change the slide, but we're seeing a change because people are expecting different kind of places. They want traditional neighborhood development, walkable neighborhoods, walkable blocks, housing and shopping nearby, human scale, compact, range of housing options, 
has a strong sense of place and preserve open space. This is what people are demanding today. But some in different generations will struggle with this. What does this mean? What does this look like? You're starting to see more and more changes in these master plan communities that are trying to develop their sites differently to be more walkable, have amenities, sidewalks on both sides. You know, even in Texas, they're doing master plans of community centers right in the middle, and they have a lifestyle directed that runs the whole place. And so here's an example of what it looks like in the Charlotte region. You're seeing a change, sidewalks on both sides. That was a big push for developers, but now they get it. People want to walk. You now have cars in the rear, so you have more uh, interaction with a porch, with a front door versus a car. Uh, these are the changes that you're seeing. You don't have to do it. I'm just letting you know here are some of the trends and patterns. And then here's a little bit more urban product, three stories, Charlotte, rail line, and is showing what people are now demanding for lifestyle choices. They don't want to drive everywhere. They want to be able to walk of all ages. Placemaking and reimagining the public route. It's about creating an experience. People go to places and they go back again because of the experience. If you go fishing, whatever you do, you love the experience. And people now want those experiences where they live. They want it to be authentic and memorable. I went on your Main Street, I hadn't seen anything like that. It's wax saw unique. And you need to make sure you preserve that character because that's what makes you different. That's why people want to come here for a day trip and spend money because you're different. That's about making the place. The power of 10. You can't do that in your town, but you could do it in the county. What is the power of 10? There's this rule of thumb that every region or city should have 10 destinations with 10 things to do within each destination. Not just one. I remember I was consulting on Whirly Gig Park in Wilson, and that's all I wanted to do, Whirly Gig Park. I said, people are going to go there one time and never come back. You have to build more experiences, restaurants, and other things so that it's a destination. And strive for 10. If you do five, that's okay. That's the power of 10. And count in this county. Do you have the power of 10? I'll skip commodity verses. Uh, don't just build a project, build a place, because it's a lot better. You'll see examples of how developers are now building places and not just projects. And it must be centered on people. I believe that people eat and sleep in their homes or apartments, but they thrive in a public space. That's where they come together. Restaurants, outdoors, parks, trails. You need those spaces. In fact, older generations were consumers of goods. I gotta buy stuff, I wanna own stuff. Very materialism, materialistic. Newer generations are consumers of experiences. That's why you see the changes people move here. I want those experiences. Beer gardens, restaurants, outdoor spaces, public spaces. Don't just build a shopping mall, build spaces outdoor where I can eat. It's changing. And I believe that we should not just be designers or planners, but we need to be experienced builders. And think about the experience that we're building for the newcomers and those that live here. Here are some examples of what people are craving, those outdoor social spaces where people can create memories. Um, I love the fact that when I think about a co-chair right now of the Raleigh Parks Bond and the experiences of taking a walk with your grandmother down a trail, watching your daughter play soccer for the first time, watching your son, Little League. These are memories that they will never forget and you will never forget, but it happens in public space. Here's another example, Moore Square in Raleigh. This is what they're now going to build and carry. I'm so jealous. Raleigh doesn't have a park like that. That is amazing, but already people can't wait to experience this new space. They now have something that they can do. It's absolutely amazing, and I can't wait. I am telling you, I am so jealous. Now, we talked about COVID. People are beginning to rethink the outdoor space. I do not believe we're going to come back to normal, normal. We'll never get back to normal. But I think it's going to take another two to three years for people to decide, will they come back to work? We just did a survey, found out that people said, either I work hybrid or I'll come in three days. Don't make me come in five days of work because I'm not coming. People are using their credit card debt. They're drowning their savings. They're borrowing money or they're living with their parents. They are not ready to come back. So we have to rethink the public space, the future of the workplace, and you're beginning to see it change. They're now offering more outdoor amenities. People want to get outdoors. 
Uh, there was these outdoor offices, and, you know, where people are dining. They just want to be able to position themselves. I should have gotten a photo of people sitting down. But now they're rethinking the use of streets where people feel more comfortable, where they can work. Uh, the open streets, the shared streets, the play streets is happening all over the country. They put out a parklet as dynamic to the street, but now people feel more comfortable coming out. But COVID will be with us for still some time. Housing affordability. Tough topic. Can, if you ever rented in your life, can you raise your hand? Can everyone just take a look around the room and just keep that snapshot in your head? Okay. It's about two-thirds. This is probably one of the most challenging issues every region in this country, not in the country, is facing. Number one, let me just say, desirable places will always have an affordability problem. And repeat that. Desirable places will always have an affordability problem. You're gonna have to figure out how to work through it rather than blaming a developer or blaming this, but no. Desirable places, because you're in demand and you have few units and products, will drive up the cost. Desirable places will have an affordable housing problem. Flint doesn't have an affordable housing problem. Some places I know in the United States does not have an affordable housing problem. I'm not saying they're not desirable, but desirable places have an affordable housing problem. So we have to understand how to diversify the product because not everyone wants to live in a single family home or can afford to live in a single family home. So we need to look at a diversity of housing types. And now the biggest trend is people are now renting single family homes for a variety of reasons. They're waiting for their house to get built. They don't want to live in multifamily. So we're seeing this trend with now interest rates going up is that I don't want to buy, but I make $200,000 a year. I don't want to buy. But in our head, when we hear rental, ooh, rentals for veterans, people with disabilities, people who work in the county, people who work in the city, emerging professionals, the ones that I showed you in the chart, are not coming back to the county. So we have to offer some of those choices. Now, I worked on a code in Raleigh where we started to share the different options, detached, attached, townhome, apartment, and we coded for it so the public understood exactly what was permitted and what to expect. And I understand Jeff did a great job uh, coming up with a new code that provides better predictability. We came up with a cottage court. This was more, I don't like to use the word density, but more people living in a location that was more lower. These are one-story cottages, but it allows more units on one piece of property. Geared towards seniors, very popular. We even came up with the accessory dwelling unit, a unit you could put in your backyard. So a person who does not want to live in a big house, if you're a senior, you can have an ADU, accessory dwelling unit built, and rent out the house, and you can retire and live out your life gracefully. Other options of providing more housing choices uh, without doing a high rise. The biggest topic being discussed today is what's called the missing middle. On one end, you have a detached home. On the other end, you have a low to mid-rise apartments. But in between, they call it the missing middle. It could be a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex, a townhouse. You don't know how many units are inside. It looks like a single family, but you're able to accommodate more people. And typically, for the most part, they're rentals unless it's a townhouse. And there's one of them. Would you have known that there are more than one units in those buildings? That's multifamily. And it's called missing middle, where you're able to accommodate more housing options. So now people who want to live in this community can now afford a place to live that is quite attractive. And as I stated, there was this trend over time of going from a small home of you know, 2,000 square feet to McMansions. The trend now is people want to have smaller homes with lots of big rooms. Don't you like that? They want to have smaller homes with lots of big rooms. Basically, they just want an open floor plan. And so they're willing to get quality for a smaller home, and that trend continues. You see the trend going down. Smaller homes, no more large homes. Oops. People also want to have access to the social gathering places. Uh, you could have a nice front yard or a backyard, but as I said, you can't have a festival, a concert there. This is what developers are now doing because they understand people are craving these places. This is the box yard in RTP, Research Triangle Park. 
And that's they just have a place, even on weekends when the park isn't open, that is now a destination people go to. They took some containers, put in a shed, and now it's a destination. Even shopping malls, they're now taking some parking spots, putting synthetic turf, kids love it, cornhole, automatic experience, it's a destination. So when I said the power of 10, there are very creative ways that you can do this. And now almost all the developers now have a central green space in a lot of their new shopping centers. Who would have thought that? I can go on and on and on. That one's in North Hills where I live. People are now creating these outdoor spaces. And it makes them feel better than going indoors for COVID. This is a growing trend, and this is what people are expecting as they move to the market. And I could just go on and on. So I'm going to close on this slide, and this is designing for climate change and resiliency. Uh, we're not all the way there yet. We're keeping an eye on California and other places. But as we see energy becoming an issue in the future, they're now shifting gears to more uh, smart homes. This is now a wave of the future. A lot of us now with our cameras and other devices, we're getting there. Homes are now being designed as smart homes. As I said, I'm not an expert in this area, but based on my research, this wave is coming. And I just love this next image um, in California. I mean, look how gorgeous, that's a solar roof. I mean, I don't know how much that house costs, but this is top end, high design, and you're starting to see more and more products. Uh, and from what I understand, this person pays nothing for energy. Everything is based on the solar. And so as people looking for electric cars and smart homes, I'm not saying that's something you should do. This is more of this may be next. Uh, so with that, here's a summary of the 10. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions in a second. Uh, for that, I want to thank you all for your participation. And now I look forward to your questions. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> Hi, Jim Hill. Uh, I think Charlotte just implemented a change in their unified, unified zoning ordinance that allows by right uh, duplexes and triplexes and maybe quadplexes in areas that are formerly zoned for single family. Any, any thoughts or comments on that approach? The question is, he understands that Charlotte in their new UDO allowed for quote unquote the missing middle to be built in single family homes. I heard about it. Uh, I'm not aware of the implications once it's been adopted. Raleigh did the same thing. And right now there is a lot of concern by some uh, that are saying that they are uncomfortable with the character of the new development. Uh, for example, in a single family historic neighborhood, one home on two acres was demolished and are putting up 17 townhomes. It's creating quite a stir, but it is by right. And so the community is quite upset. But we know in order to keep affordability, we have to increase density. If we keep saying no to density, then we have to say Raleigh is not going to be an affordable place. I suspect the same is the case for Charlotte. I think they had different reasons. Some believe that single family zoning didn't have the best track record of the past. And so I don't know all the politics, but I do believe it was passed by a narrow margin. I just don't know the implications since it's been adopted. But I can tell you what happened in Raleigh, and right now it's an active issue with some, not all, uh, that are very concerned about the change of character uh, in their neighborhood. How are you doing? Uh, Pedro Mori. Um, this might be a little off topic, but just uh, maybe in a, uh, your opinion. How do you see the future of transportation as it relates to the way we're going to on these, uh, these homes or these, these venues? The car is not going away. Whether it's gas or electric, the car is not going away. Don't know the future about autonomous vehicles. That is on the horizon. What is probably going to be the trend is people are going to create walkable enclaves. And that is where people will start to, they want to be within a 10 minute walk of services. So what you'll probably see first is that more walkable places with a trail network or a sidewalk network that's more walkable, so they have the option to walk, bike, or take the car. 
but they're gonna be based in these nodes and enclaves. Over time, they can be connected, but I believe that's the trend going forward. But in a region like this, not a major city where you must have mass transit, car is still going to dominate, but you will see some pockets where people would want to have walkable places that they can enjoy. One of the biggest trends we're seeing right now is you take a shopping center and you rezone for multifamily around it, you get the density, but not the car trips, because all the car trips are captured within the shopping center. And I remember we, did, we started doing that in Raleigh, and I had a student of mine, he told me his parents are so happy because now they can live, not downtown, but in a more urbanized setting, and they walk everywhere. The services are right there outside their door. And so that's another way of looking at aging out shopping centers or new shopping centers, allow more multifamily surrounding it, and that captures, you don't get all the traffic that people are concerned about. You get more traffic from single family than you would from having it close to a shopping center because now they can walk to it. Those in single family would have to drive to it. So that is what I do believe. But autonomous vehicles, it's still on the table. Other than that, uh, this is still a auto-dominated society and it's not gonna change anytime soon. Just in pockets. Edwin Elam, um, well done. Just wanted to say well done. As a reader and a traveler, well done. Like the presentation. Thank you. No questions. Okay, thank you. Because you had some good ones for me before we started. And I was like saying, oh, he's going to have a good question. We have one in the back. Hello. I have a question for you, sir. Yes. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand this. So when you're talking about making housing more affordable and you're talking, I just want to make sure I fully understand this. You're talking about adding the density in a county like Union County when we're dealing with infrastructure, infrastructure balances, what would you suggest um, in order for us to accomplish that? When you say infrastructure, there's always going to be, when you're growing, there's always going to be areas of short-term pain until the infrastructure can catch up. I don't know many places, unless you can work with a developer that's willing to build some of the infrastructure or share some of that construction, that typically as development goes in, now it's, you recognize if you have a plan that these are the roads that have to be expanded. You want to pick your growth nodes so you know exactly what thoroughfares and roads need to be targeted. And so that's part of planning. Far too often what I hear is don't approve it because we don't have the infrastructure. Uh, it's a chicken and an egg and typically everyone has a constitutional right to develop their property. Yes, at different scales. And as you're a growing place, you want to work with your plan department. I'm sure Lisa's doing a very great job of anticipating where the growth should occur so they know over time we have to deal with this transportation facility. But far too often people said, don't build because we don't have infrastructure. You have to do it side by side. Planning is a profession that balances growth with infrastructure, both sewer, water, roads, and there's always going to be short-term pain for the long-term gain. Yeah, I was, sorry, you said, you said close. Uh, I talked to you a little bit about, before the meeting, about infrastructure, and you've answered most of the question there. Um, you know, we have a draw here, good schools, low taxes. It's a desirable place to be, but the infrastructure isn't equipped. And you talked about the short-term pain, but if we raise taxes to pay for the infrastructure, we've lost one of the things that makes us such a desirable place to come to. I don't know many places that let's build our two-lane road to a four-lane divided. Let's just do it right now. And, and maybe the, the expense of doing that, the new growth increases your tax base, which allows you to start investing, either through bonds or other techniques. I don't know many places we want to grow. Let's take this facility and make it two lanes with a median in between, four or five mile length. That would be tens of millions of dollars without any approvals in the pipeline. Now we're ready for development. Typically what happens is that as it's being planned, the planning department's writing down what's in the pipeline, they see the growth that's coming, they coordinate with transportation planning, in some cases NCDOT, to say demand is coming, we have to start focusing on this facility 
because it's gonna be overwhelmed through all the new traffic. So there's gonna be short-term gain to long-term gain, short-term pain for long-term gain. I don't know any place that actually builds it first unless there's a master plan community where they do all their interior roads and they are required to build that infrastructure up front. But the county facilities or city facilities, I haven't seen someone say, let's just build it first before they come. It's usually the other way around. And that's the pain of growing places. They can experience in that, and I can name any place across the country that that is a scenario that they go through. Thank but you. you have to have a plane apartment. Now, what I used to get frustrated is that the public utilities director would start extending utilities over here when I was telling the, board of edu the school board the growth was going to happen here. And so we had to stop extending utilities and focus on the areas that were growing because we know that's where water, sewer, roads, where we were planning to expand and invest, not in this part of town. So we, that's where you get that dilemma. If you plan it, you know what's coming, you can start to anticipate it in advance versus like, here's the growth. You want to make sure you have a coordinated plan that balances growth and infrastructure so that short-term pain is shorter. I'd like to follow up on that. Uh, in North Carolina, as you know, we are not a home rule state, but we're not actually a Dillon's rule state either. And towns are children of the state as are counties. But most towns in North Carolina do not control at water and sewer. Particularly here in, in, in Union County, nor do we control the roads. So I understand that you've got to have the tax base in order to pay for the infrastructure. By the same token, you've got a, a citizenry that says, wait a minute, we can't stand any more development because the roads are jammed and we don't and the schools are crowded. So what's the secret sauce? for us to get all on the same page and perhaps work together. Who's doing it right? You have a metropolitan planning organization, which is regional. You have county planning entities, which is more local. And I'm sure is the case that the planning departments have to have close collaboration and they have a planning function. They are aware about the growth that is occurring. I am sure if you look at plans, they're looking at what roads are being impacted excuse me, where utilities are being extended. So if it's not happening at the local level, it's certainly happening at the county level. It's hard for me to believe that they're looking the other way. I'm not familiar with what's happening in Union County, but because people have a constitutional right to develop their property, saying no to growth is not an option. The question is, how do you work together to provide the best balanced growth that doesn't impact the residents that much? It's hard for me to believe that the region and the county is not aware of the growth that is occurring and are planning accordingly. I drove up a couple of places. I've seen two-lane divided. Someone planned that. They knew it was coming. And so, again, you're a place that's experiencing growth. You'd rather be a place that's growing <laughs> than a place that's shrinking. And so the question is, how do you manage that going forward? I would make sure that uh, Lisa or others, if they want to have some kind of forum, where the county comes on board to say, how are you handling the growth? How are you handling the infrastructure? I am telling you with my years of experience, I doubt there's someone in county government that's just saying, I'm not paying attention to this. I just don't know the answer. But I do know when I was Raleigh Planning Director, we met with the Wake County Planning Director and Planning Department on a monthly basis. All the towns coordinated their projects. So even though it was across the border, we knew what Morrisville was doing, what Cary was doing. We all planned together. We had Campo, that was our municipal planning organization, to plan the region for transportation. And so those functions exist. Uh, it's just that some places may get prioritized before this place, but I'm telling you, I know that is, that is going on. It has to. Over there. Thank you for being here this evening. Earlier, you mentioned an interesting statistic that a Gen Y is not coming back to this county, or, or specifically to Waxhaw, even. I'm curious, if you play that out, where does that take us? If we don't do anything about that, well, where does that leave us? Well, because you're not an island, people you draw from different parts of the region. 
All I'm saying is, whatever reason it is, there's deciding not to come back here. The implication is you lose that segmented population and is gonna be replaced most likely with people from other parts of the country or region moving in because there's, this is the place they wanna live. Beyond that, the question is why? Why is that generation, that age cohort deciding not to come back? And I don't know that answer because I don't have the insight. But it, it's shocking because I showed you the state, Charlotte, Mecklenburg, the US, that is not the trend. So there's something going on, and I gave you some scenarios. They're not happy about the housing options, they can't afford it, they don't like the lifestyle, there aren't enough great experiences for them to enjoy, I don't know. But in terms of the implications, it's just that generation deciding not to come back. And it will be filled by someone else. Just a quick comment. Um, I have two now adult children, and in part of a response to um, the question, they could not find a place to live in this area. And they did not want to buy homes. They wanted more of apartments or townhomes, and they wanted more of a feel of being able to get out and get around, to walk, to go to stores. So they moved further out because there was nothing here for them or even convenient for them to work in this area that, want, that told them they should stay here. Yeah. They didn't want my 5,000 square foot home. They wanted something smaller and they wanted to be able to get out and about and have that type of living and experience, which I think is more similar to a yeah. Waverly style way of living. So that's why they didn't stay. Now, what I can tell you where this research comes from, where it's truly dramatic, uh, is what they call shrinking counties. Now, the census some years ago changed it because they were calling it dying counties. They changed it to shrinking counties. These are counties that have an aging, usually in rural America, they have an aging population and the young people saying, I'm out. I am not coming back. And for that case, it's dramatic because they're losing the next generation of who will inherit the farm, who will help the economy. And so if I showed you maps, it's shocking. Pennsylvania is one of the worst that I've seen, where literally there are counties shrinking. No one's moving in, and the young people are saying, I don't like the style. I'm going to Chicago. I'm going to Charlotte. I'm going to Raleigh. I am not staying here. That is dramatic because you see their economy shrinking, and their labor force is also shrinking. And there's a lot of tension about bringing immigrant workforce. It even gets worse. So those places is where that issue you talked about is worse. When you're a shrinking place, you're growing. So that's when I said, as those young people leave, your children aren't coming back. You'll have people from New York, New Jersey, California, Illinois, parts of North Carolina will be filling the gap because it'll keep your population stable and your labor force stable as well. Yeah, I just wanted to offer, I think Brenda said what I was gonna say, or just offered the same hypothesis. and and. Uh, the two reasons in my mind are, are one, it's boring, <laughs> right? No, I'm sure. I mean, for younger people, this is a boring place to live because we don't have the things that you, you put on the slide, the places, the entertainment. So one, it's boring, and two, it's too expensive. Yeah, I can't, I can't, and I, I've seen the phenomenon in other, you know, suburbs close to metro areas. The other, but the other part of it that you see is eventually, they do come back if there's a place for them to come back. But not, because they come but back not within they, an age cohort. Well, not, yeah, they, not when they get cohort. older, they may return. They want to come there's back no question. If they can they afford it, they may return. Well, and they want to come back for the schools because they, 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 move, they move, they have children. No, they're showing, no, it's, it's, they have to be working professionals because that, if I go back to show you the, the Gen Z population, they're 25 to 5, that 20 year span. So for the time being, they're not here. They're not coming back. Now, maybe when they're 40, they may return, when they get married and have a family, or just have a, not just ha raise kids with no spouse, but for the time being, they're not here. I'm not sure if you want that to plan growth, though. That's not planning growth, that's talking about the choices being offered. I don't know why 
that is going on. I'd have to do a lot more research. But for whatever reason, that is an anomaly for this region, that that population is not there. Uh, and I don't know what it is, but the implications, as I said, it'll, they'll just be replaced by other newcomers coming in. To me, it was just, is there something that we need to take a look at that's not capturing or retaining those young people who grew up in this community? Right. Uh, my personal experience, uh, lived in Chicago when I was 29 years old. Great place for a single 29-year-old. But even back then, it was tough to raise a family in the city. And it's less so today. So like I said, well, I mean, the way I was hearing is that's not a, a demographic or, a, or an issue that you want to plan your city's growth around. I think, yeah, you could be concerned. Yeah, we'd like for, where there's young people, where there's youth, where there's vibrance, there's activity, and uh, that, that can help with the overall lifestyle right. um, quality. But to actively court them. Their future home back. buyers. Their future home buyers. Say again? Their future home buyers. So 20 years from now, the question yeah. is, is this county a place they want to move to and it may come to a point where I, I don't care. Well, people are moving, well, for wax off, people are moving here today right? because of, well, the people, number one. And number two, it, it's a nice place. I mean, yeah. the weather's great. Uh, we, we are in close proximity to the, you know, parts of the region that have stuff as traffic. I think that's where the, the pain is, as traffic gets more and more. We don't want to travel. 13 miles 30 years ago took less than a half hour. 13 miles today can take you an hour. Right. So I understand yeah. that. However, to actively court them and that, that uh, younger demographic, it, it gets to be, uh, it, it starts to affect the quality of life for the people that have moved here for yeah you'd have to be reason. specific about quality of life I mean these are our kids I just need to understand when you say quality well, I would of life. love for my daughter who just went to Raleigh for school I'd love her to move back but I understand that for yeah for for her to move back here we would need to have something right. like Noda or a bigger beer gardens like South End something like that I understand that, but is that what, our region does need it here in Union County. I can understand that, but there's towns that yeah. don't necessarily. It does not have to be a beer garden. They can be family friendly activities. What I'm saying is, as you look to future generations that are now emerging, they have different values and needs than just what is being developed today. I'm just saying there should be options and choices, not saying we have to court this population. It's broader than that. Do you have housing choices that appeal to an elderly person who now can no longer afford their home, for a veteran who now wants to live in a great place, for a young professional, for a young family? What I'm saying is both person but also generation that things are changing and you're gonna start seeing demand for new experiences in your town. It doesn't have to be a beer garden. It could be a fun activity, it could be a park. So I just wanna make sure as we talk about this, you saw that line. You are shooting up and growing like a rocket. And so the people are coming, and it better be prepared for that growth than to say we're not really sure because it's gonna roll you over like a, it's gonna roll you over like a steamroller. It's better to be prepared to talk about how you wanna plan for that than not, because the growth is coming. The growth is coming. Hey, y'all. Uh, hi, Michael Evelyn. Good to meet you. Oh. So I can tell you why. Um, well, I'm 25 years old, which I guess puts me in Gen Z. Upper end of Gen Z. There you go. So it is unaffordable. Um, I talk to my friends a lot, and I love living in Waxhaw. My family and I have lived in Waxhaw ever since I was six, five, six years old. Moved here back in 2006. I love living here, I love being a part of the town, but 
a lot of my friends are leaving because it's just so unaffordable. There's not housing that we can afford here. And when one, two bedrooms go for $1,600, $1,800 a month, and with the cost of living and inflation and, and wages, just, it, it's, it's just unaffordable for us young working professionals. So you see a lot of us moving out of Union County and into places like Mecklenburg County where you can have the housing options like apartments or townhouses where you can rent and have two, three young right. people occupy. So, uh, to, uh, I want to go off of what, a little bit of what Mayor Horn said and when you've got certain places that may have, and I'm not picking on, on the specifics there because this happens everywhere, you've got regional growth, you've got statewide growth, people that come to the Carolinas, people that come to the Charlotte region, there are some, either whether it's a town, whether it's a county, certain uh, folks don't want the growth. They say, we, we've, we've grown too much. I moved here because it was rural, or I moved here, there's the, the NIMBYs or the slow the growth down folks, and it's, again, it's not just here. I was at a rezoning in, in Harnett County this week, and you get this small town, they said, we don't want to be like Fuquay. So it's, it's everywhere where they say they don't want to do what, what they say. They want all the amenities. There is a downside to not growing and not planning for that growth if the growth is coming to your region. I, I wonder if maybe you could address that. It's kind of that no build scenario because think people I think believe if we don't have them, them coming here to our town or our county, then we won't have the, the additional infrastructure issues. Yep. But there is a no build scenario that hurts them as well. Well, constitutionally, unless you take property, uh, you cannot stop growth or development. Everyone has a right to develop their property under the existing development rules for that town, that county. So if someone has a piece of property, they want to develop it, it just depends on how intense it is. If you, as a little island, decide not to grow, all the other municipalities around you can grow, and you're still going to get the growth pressures from the outside. This state is desirable. People want to come here. There are some in this room that moved here for that very reason. I'm from New York, that's why I moved back to North Carolina, and there are many I've talked to that are coming here. They're coming. I don't know how you can put a gate at the borders and say you cannot move to North Carolina. So we have to figure out how do we manage that growth, but if you don't grow, I lived in New Jersey, they were a no growth municipality, what happened is their taxes had to go up for every homeowner because as cost went up, there were no new growth to draw the taxes from. So they went back to the taxpayers. My taxes went in New Jersey when I moved there in 1998. It was $3,000. When I moved in 2005 to Raleigh, it was $8,000. Why? Police, fire, this, that. They had to raise taxes. They had to give them raises, cost of living, but we had no new growth because our population was stable. And so they did things like mutual aid agreement and consolidating police departments and fire departments, but they ran out of all those options. So growing helps keep taxes stable. If it stays flat, sooner or later, you have to pay teachers more money and police more money and fire department more money and see employees more money and things go up. So that's what I'm saying that having a growing place is inevitable, it's going to happen. No growth has consequences and growth has consequences. My recommendation, you have a great planning team here, both the city town manager and the planning director that will help you manage that growth. So you know where it's gonna go, you know it's predictable, so you can get ahead of the curve and not be behind the curve. You wanna lead that development versus following it. I just want to piggyback on this young man's comment about why people are not coming back. And it's really price. They can't afford it. And there's no real jobs here. They're in Charlotte. They're not in the county. They're up another place. And they want to walk, like you said, walkability. They want to have the job right in their front yard or even in their home, which a lot of them do because of COVID. Everything's gone known almost to homes. 
The other thing we have right now is the price of homes have gone up so high, almost everybody's single family home has increased at least $100,000 in this last year or last yep. 18 months. How could somebody graduating from college, starting out on their very first big job, afford to live here? They can't. They just can't. And that is, first of all, thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure that, first of all, I want to underscore, this is a beautiful region and a beautiful town. I drove in here. I understand why people are moving here. If I didn't buy my house in town, in townhouse in Raleigh, I told the mayor, you know, he's trying to recruit me to come here. This is a great place. But the secret's out. People know. Let me say something very nuanced to explain why places become unaffordable, particularly in the last couple of years. A home is on the market. Somebody is on a market for 300,000. Somebody from California coming like saying, 300? No, I'll give you five. Cash, five. As you multiply house sale after house sale after house sale after house sale, I don't blame any American for their God-given right to get as much as they can for their property. The implication is prices go up across the board. Not a developer, a homeowner exercising their right. It then translates to the rental market because now there's less supply of that. So it's this weird cycle where people are upset about affordability. I would not dare tell someone, don't take the 500,000. You only ask for 300, take the 300. How many people would do that? None. So we're a victim of the cycle where we're trying to get as much as we can for our property, but the implication is it has a trickle effect on the affordability of a region, which translates to the rental housing market. So that is an impossible problem to fix. Raleigh and other places are doing something unusual. They pass an affordable housing bond because they, they, you know, they'll try to work with developers to do various things. But it's a very complicated issue. But the last couple of years, it did slow down. Prices are now dropping. But it really set a new ceiling or a floor for housing prices, the median housing price in this region. I'm sure it went up, what, yeah, you said $100,000. So that is where you need to offer other options for people like this young man to rent and probably live. And so that's why I'm saying, you know, I heard things are going on here. I saw some of the projects being built. I'm excited for you. You're heading in the right direction. I just want to make sure, like the greatest generation, some of us are willing to give up our today for the next generations tomorrow. Three more. Woo. All right. I'm glad I trained for marathons. This has been intense tonight. Okay. So I'm Matt Hubert, I'm the assistant town manager for Waxhaw, I'm the town engineer, and what I saw tonight was, was really exciting, because like you said, Jeff and Dina and Lisa are all, I think, right in line with, with the logic here and where, where we want to go. Uh, for me, I really want to make it a walkable town to, so you don't have to get in your car to enjoy the amenities that we already have and ones that are to come. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, kind of is, a, is an issue right now, and I'm wondering if there's maybe a, a simple code to be able to, to plug in, is uh, when we try and get our trails connected between one neighborhood and another, and we have a lot of creeks that are typically the boundary, how do I get them to build half a bridge, right? Um, can that be in the development code, or does that have to come from another, another source? Oh. Is it, is it public, is it a, you're trying to get a private entity right, to build it? Private, right, private, In many cases, and I want to say this, that could be discussed during a rezoning application. If you have a relationship with the developer, it's a big cost. It's to their advantage. It's a selling point for that development. I shared with you, if people know, like I was looking for a neighborhood that was connected to a greenway. I'm not even close to a greenway, and I'm upset about that. But that is a selling point. And so for them to put that cost up front increases the value of that product. So I can't say you could put it in a code per se because you can't force them. If it was a rezoning, and I understand your zoning is a little bit different, you could work it out in condition use case. But if not, uh, you can see how they would donate that connection. Hopefully it's not too expensive because it adds value to their project by you are within close proximity of a four-mile greenway. To me, that is a selling point. 
Don't know if it's going to work. Thank you. Oh, you do have a question. Well, yes. Okay. Uh, in looking at uh, or listening to some of the questions that have come forth and quality of life and those kinds of questions, what, what communities around the country are having the conversation where all of the, uh, share, uh, all of the uh, stakeholders come to the table, where we know that our population in this particular region will not look like the makeup that it looks like in this room yeah. right now, Nobody will probably say that but me, but it is going to look different, and we have to then start to include all of those stakeholders that have almost never been included in the conversation throughout the entire county. Well, if you saw the map, I think this county jumped into the 10% uh, people of color, so there was some change, but it wasn't as dramatic as uh, Mecklenburg. I think, number one, we all have to recognize this conversation is happening all over the country. It's not unique to this region. People don't like change. They know what they know, and they are struggling for change. If I took you back to 1960, before the explosion happened, Waxhaw didn't look anything like it looked like today. Yet, people love it the way it is. But if they said no in 1960, you wouldn't have anything you have right now today. But little by little, the planners of that time managed to grow and everyone says they love it. Because I can tell you the same conversation was happening in 1960 and 1970. A room just like this, stop the growth, don't let them come, and now this is a place where we're saying, we love it, no more growth. This conversation's happening all over the country. What is being introduced now is today, people are looking for housing choices. It's not just single family. I don't wanna buy one, I don't want the responsibility, I wanna be a good renter, and that's it. That's the tension that's happening because people have an image of what renters are versus homeowners or afraid of neighborhood character and density. That's, they think, the challenge is happening across the country. But places that get it right, they're doing quite well and they're quite affluent and everyone lives in harmony. It's just hard for people to make that mental leap because in their head, they have an image of what, how different it's gonna be than it is today. It need, I think it's already started. I drove your town. It already started. I started seeing the townhomes. I saw a multifamily. What's across the street is stunning. That's beautiful across the street. I, I, you want more of that. That's beautiful. I, me, I would just want to have multifamily around it so that people, older people, young people, now have a destination they can go to so they don't have to drive to that center. But that is stunning. It has everything. Supermarket, outdoor dining. We just throw through it. Actually, I want to... Take another ride over there before we leave. And it's attractive, well-designed. Um, in regards to Gen Z being the future home buyers of America, um, and their trends obviously pointing towards renting, with no equity being earned in what you're renting, do you see that causing no, I, a problem towards purchasing any type of home in the future if they're obviously not able to earn any type of money yeah. in what they're paying for? You must be Gen Z. Uh, I didn't say Gen Z, I said potentially could be future home buyers. When I said earlier that the millennials buying homes shocked everyone, I will give you a very scary statistic which I shared about six or seven years ago. The prediction was there would be 30 million single family homes on the market with nobody to buy them. Because a single person or a single person household would not want to have a large single family home because that was a predominant product in the US. That all changed with COVID. It was absorbed. For how long, I don't know. That trend may come back because you said the key thing between student debt, what happened with COVID and the labor force. I'm not confident a lot of Gen Z's will be able to buy a home. I said if they do, they may want to return to Waxhaw. But that trend continues as you see people aging and they sell their home, the millennials are the market they have to sell it to because now they're the largest, 76 million Gen Y. That's the market that wants to buy your home. But up until COVID, they were like, I'm not gonna live out in the suburb, I'm not gonna have a 5,000 square foot home. And so the prediction was it'd be 30 million single family homes on the market with nobody to buy them. A single woman would not drive 10 miles into the county to buy a home. But that now is being disrupted. We have to see what happens post COVID. So you're right. They have to keep the buyer in mind. 
You're now doing tiny homes, small homes, inexpensive, so you have housing options. All I'm saying is, you want to have a single family? Just make it smaller. Look for options so that people who do want to live here have those choices versus just one product. Because when I moved to Raleigh, I had two choices. I could have bought a single family home or I could have bought a single family home. So I bought a single family home. The minute I came back, <laughs> I bought a townhouse and I'm happy. It's a beautiful, actually that was my townhouse. I showed in the slide, just so I'm bragging. Uh, it's a beautiful three-story townhouse. I have to stay healthy, my wife and I, because we'll have to navigate those stairs. But you just, we want to make sure you have those choices so if you want to come back, you have options. Anyway, is that the last one? I just, I just wanted to kind of piggyback on that. We had lots of conversations over dinner, which was very enjoyable. Thank you for that. Um, to your point, Hunter, a little bit, what sometimes we're finding in the marketplace now is you're real estate oriented in your thinking. You're looking for to build that equity and build some type of something for your future. What we're seeing in the marketplace now, to a lot of his point, is that particular owner or renter or person in that house, they're not always thinking about the equity. They don't care. They want flexibility and lifestyle. If they don't like where they're living, they don't want to be saddled with having to deal with the sale of that house or maintain it. Or even potentially, if a market turns down on you, you lose the equity. They want flexibility. They want, here's my 30-day notice. I'm out of here. They don't always care. I'm kind of generalizing, but they don't always care about the equity because they haven't seen it. So they're used to paying rent. They're going to continue to pay rent. And so that's a little bit kind of adding on to it. So, Ms. Brenda. Can I make a confession? My Jen, oops, it's off. Um, so my daughter lives in New York. She's renting. And it's so tough. And this is true. Not only do I have to co-sign, I pay half my daughter's rent every month. I mean, that's what it is being a renter, how tough the market is. I would love for her to move back to North Carolina so I either would pay half less rent or she'd have a great place to live. But that's the dilemma, and she's Gen Z. She wanted to stay in New York, but in order for her to stay, I gave her one year, that was August. She didn't even tell me. She renewed her lease without telling me, but that's love, right? The subsidy Anyway, runs thank out you sometime. all. Uh, thank you all. Tough questions. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for caring. I know you care deeply about the community. I just wanted to offer you another point of view, some food for thought. But my parting remarks is, you saw the trend line. You're growing. It's not whether you're going to grow or you want to stop growing. You're growing. How do you want to make sure you work together to manage that growth so it's the best quality city, town, and region as possible? I'm going to stick around if you have more questions. Thank you so much for your time and attention.